I would like to introduce our presenter, Nona Schultz Ferris, the HACCP and Regulatory Coordinator at the Food Development Center in Portage. Nona will take a closer look at how to get started on a preventative control plan and provide a more in-depth overview of the PCP tools and templates. Welcome, Nona. Hello again, or welcome to any new participants who missed the first part of our webinar. Um, we'll continue with the second part of the webinar, which will hopefully explain the preventive controls and preventive control plan aspects of the Safe Food for Canadians Act. Preventive controls are the equivalent of good manufacturing practices or prerequisite programs of a HACCP program. Preventive controls are the programs and procedures that you have in place to control the hazards associated with the production of your products. Any hazard you don't control through a preventive control would then become a critical control point in your preventive control plan. So preventive controls are based on the Codex Alimentarius general principles of food hygiene and the um, World Organization of Animal Health and Terrestrial Animal Health Code. So that's what the CFIA is basing their um, preventive control requirement on. Preventive control plans are the equivalent of a HACCP plan in a HACCP document. Okay, they're a written document prepared and maintained and implemented by a food business. Um, it lists, the preventive control plan lists all of the hazards associated with making your product from the condition of the production facility, the ingredients, allergens, production practices, to the shipping and handling conditions of the product when it leaves your facility and the labeling and regulatory requirements of the product. The HACCP plan, the difference between a HACCP plan and a PCP, a HACCP plan is concerned mainly with food safety. A preventive control plan includes hazards associated with food safety, food quality, correct labeling, regulatory requirements, as well as the humane treatment of food animals. Those items are not all required in a HACCP program. HACCP programs have required GMPs or prerequisite programs. Some of those may not be required in order for you to control the hazards associated with your product. With a HACCP program, in order to be certified with a HACCP program, you need to address all of the sections in the program in order to implement a complete program. With a preventive control plan, you don't need to have any required preventive controls, you only need to address the hazards which directly apply to the production of your product. So a PCP is essentially like a HACCP program. It uses hazard analysis and it describes the process controls used to control the hazards associated with your food production, but you don't need to have a complete HACCP plan to have a preventive control program. So what the CFIA has done is they've re reduced the um, requirements a little bit and said, you don't have to have a HACCP program, you just need to control the hazards that are associated with the production of your product. Right about now, you're grabbing your head and screaming because you just want me to tell you what to do. Unfortunately, Although it's not difficult, it's not quite that simple either. So we're going to start with the preventive controls. This page, this web page, the preventive controls web page, you get to it through the My CFIA um, web portal. CFIA has provided 
overviews which are required for your preventive controls and we'll be returning to this page multiple times as it contains most of the required links. If you click, click this lovely link here, requ regulatory requirements, it will lead you to the regulatory requirements of the preventive controls. So the information provided here describes which sections of the Safe Food for Canadians regulations apply to each preventive control. So each preventive control is like the prerequisite programs or the good manufacturing practices, GMPs, of a HACCP program. This is really something that you should read through if you're serious about writing your own preventive controls. You really need to do the exercise and read through it so that you understand it. Um, Actually, I'd even suggest that if you're going to hire somebody, a consultant or somebody else to do this for you, that you still read through it so that you understand what that person is going to be doing for you. So if we go back to the previous screen and we select the controls for establishment link, This page lists all of the recommended preventive controls for establishments. You may not need to implement every section. So for example, you may not have any sources of condensation in your production. If you're doing dry processing, then there'd be no source of condensation. Or you may not use culinary steam. If that's the case, you don't need to have a written pre preventive control to explain how you control these hazards. For an example, what I'm going to do is, oops, sorry, I advanced too fast. Um, I'm going to select the cleaning and sanitation program. So one thing you need to remember, the documents you create for your preventive control plan will be the documents you use to train your staff on how to follow the programs and procedures and how you'll document that the procedures are followed in your establishment. The next few slides explain the things you need to include in your cleaning and sanitation program. All of the examples of the preventive controls on the CFIA website are explained the same way. So they'll have an introduction section um, of what you need to know, what's not included, what's included, the purpose, all those lovely things. Um, one of the things that should be included in your cleaning and sanitation program is the definitions of cleaning and sanitation. CFIA summarizes this very well in the text box on this slide right here. So this lovely little blurb should probably be somewhere in your cleaning and sanitation program because what it does is explains the difference between cleaning and sanitation and that's something that's important to have in your program so that if you have to train other people on the program that you write, it's there to explain to them. The next section on this same page is the purpose, if you scroll further down, is the purpose of the program. So the purpose of this document was to provide guidance to help food business to comply with the requirements of the SFCR. So it's your choice to use it or not. It tells you what's included and what's not included. For the purpose of my example, I'm gonna use a company who produces strawberry jam. They're gonna make their jam in a commercial kitchen. The only piece of equipment they use is a food processor and an automated filler. And the name of the company is going to be Grammy Pies Strawberry Jam. So here's my lovely company, Grammy Pies Strawberry Jam. They pro produce their product in a pro excuse me, provincially licensed commercial kitchen. There's three employees, Grandma, Grandpa, and Aunt Joe. Sometimes Uncle Bob and the grandkids. The equipment that they use, stove, pot, spoons, bowls, scoops, scales, food processor, automatic filler, and a thermometer. 
So those are going to be the main components of the example that I used today. So the next slide on the preventive or the next section on the preventive controls cleaning sanitation program description starts talking about um, the roles and the responsibilities and the three steps that are used in the development of a cleaning and sanitation program. So one of the, th the three steps are, as they are here, gather information, develop templates for records and develop your records and implement the program. So those are the three steps that you're going to need to take. So the first thing you want to do is gather information needed to develop your cleaning and sanitation program. So this lists all the things that you're going to need to think about. What areas need to be cleaned? Do different areas have different cleaning requirements? Dry processing areas versus wet processing areas, storage areas, coolers, freezers, sanitation rooms. What equipment needs to be cleaned? Does the equipment have manuals? Do does the equipment require assembly and disassembly? Are tools required for the assembly and disassembly? Are there special cleaning requirements for the equipment? Is the cleaning done during production? If the cleaning is done during production, how are you going to protect the food and packaging materials that are um, exposed while you're cleaning? These are the things that you want to take into consideration and write down and the answers to these things need to be in your preventive control for cleaning and sanitation. So you need to ensure when you're going through and thinking about what you need to do, you need to ensure you answer the following questions. Number one is who. So identify all the people or positions that will be responsible for cleaning. It's better to use job titles as you can, as the positions generally don't change, but the people might change. For small companies, I tend to use the phrase, the staff of whoever or trained designate, designate. So when you identify the person or persons responsible for cleaning activities, who's responsible? So you have grandma, grandpa, and Aunt Jo. Is there anyone else? Well, Uncle Bob and the grandkids sometimes have um, help as well. So the best way to describe who is responsible for cleaning would be Grammy Pies, Strawberry Jam staff, or trained designate. That's a nice, short, sweet way of saying anybody in the company is responsible for doing the cleaning and sanitizing. The next question is where? So what areas need to be cleaned? What kind of facility does Grammy Pie Strawberry Jam use? Well, there's a commercial kitchen. Where is it located? It's in a community hall. Is it in a school? Is it in a restaurant? What areas of the facility need to be cleaned? So you need to identify each room or area that needs to be cleaned and sanitized. So there's a kitchen, there's washrooms, there's a utility room, there's the hall area. And in the hall area of the commercial kitchen, there's an entryway, shipping and receiving area. There's storage areas where there's food storage, where there's equipment storage. Are you using any other facility? So are you storing your product at another facility that you're not producing your product at. You need to provide sanitation in those areas too. Um, are you using another store or another area for storage of product or ingredients? You need to make sure you include all of that information and all of the information on all of the facilities that need to be cleaned. The third question you need to ask yourself is what? For the rooms and areas that you've identified that need to be cleaned, you need to specify the type and concentration of cleaning compounds and all the equipment, including utensils, structures, and surfaces, food contact and non-food contact that need to be cleaned and sanitized. So what cleaners do you use? 
dish soap? Is there a special cleaner that's required for some equipment? What do you use as a sanitizer? Most people use bleach for a sanitizer in small produce, production facilities. Um, some people use a hot water dishwasher. Are there specific, specific considerations for the cleaners and sanitizers that you're using? So are there concentrations that you need to achieve? For bleach, you have to achieve 100 to 200 parts per million or you have to provide a rinse after. If it's under 100 parts per million, it's not sufficient for sanitation anymore. If it's over 200 parts per million, it requires a rinse. For a hot water dishwasher, how do you ensure the water temperature is hot enough to sanitize? There are cards that you can get, tape that you can put through one use, um, autoclave type tape that you put through your dishwasher and it'll change color once the temperature is achieved to reach sanitation. You need to make sure that you include these um, include these test measures in your process, in your preventive control. What equipment do you use for cleaning? Brushes, mops, pails, cloths, spray bottles. Those things need to be included in your sanitation program. How are you going to do your sanitation? I'm going to spray with a spray bottle of prepared sanitizer. I'm going to use a bucket of prepared sanitizer and a clean one-use cloth. What equipment needs to be cleaned? So with Grammy Pie Strawberry Jam, you need to list all the utensils, the stove, the filler, the pots, the thermometer, the walls, the floors, the drains, the ceilings, the range hood. All those things need to be included in your preventive control for cleaning and sanitation. When? Basically, you need to say how often you're going to do the sanitation, frequency of the cleaning and sanitation based on risk. So how often do things need to be cleaned? The pots, the thermometers, floors, ceilings, each room and piece of equipment may have different frequencies for cleaning. The equipment used for production is usually easy. Those pieces you're going to Pieces of equipment and utensils get cleaned each time after use. Floors may get cleaned at the end of each shift. How often do you need to clean the ceilings? How often do you need to clean the range hood? Are these item and items you're responsible for cleaning or are they items that the facility that you were using to produce is responsible for cleaning? How will you get the owners of the building or the rental agency to clean these areas? At Grammy Pie Strawberry Jam, they make multiple batches of jam in one day. So one batch is equal to one pot. The pot needs to be washed, washed between batches to avoid product buildup, which causes burning and scorching of the product. So how do you make sure that you clean the pots and make sure all the ingredients and products aren't contaminated by the cleaner or sanitizer? So what you're going to have to make sure that you write in your preventive control program is that you ensure all ingredients are covered, packaging material isn't in the sanitation area, that you're not using high pressure water to do your washing, that the pots will be washed in soapy water and sanitized prior to reuse. But you need to make sure that you explain everything in writing in your preventive control. How is the next question. How do you start cleaning? What do you need to do to provide or, or to make sure your cleaning is sufficient? You have to remove or cover all ingredients and final products. Usually you start with dry cleaning. You remove the garbage, sweep the floors, remove debris from counters. Then you do your wet clean. So you prepare your cleaning solutions, make sure your water's hot enough, 
Test the concentrations and the cleaning or of your cleaning and sanitation solutions. Disassemble equipment, clean equipment. Make sure you add things like don't clean the surface of the stove until it's cool enough to touch. Are there any general housekeeping procedures that you use in your facility to ensure that the facility is maintained? So in your warehouse, you have to write things like clean up spills immediately, pick up the garbage so that there's not debris on the floor. You need to explain how you take pieces of equipment apart. So for the food processor, do you need to disassemble your food processor? Is there a blade? Does the tub come off the base of the processor? Um, is there any area which is hard to clean? So a lot of food processor blades have a hollow um, a hollow area where the blade sits on the control. That area in there usually gets full of product. So that's one of the areas that you need to make sure that you list in your preventive control program to tell people to check there to make sure that it's clean. The next thing you need to do is provide evidence showing your control measure is effective. How do you know that what you're doing is sufficient to clean and sanitize? Chemical manufacturers have documentation indicating that the cleaner, if used at a correct temperature, will clean the type of clean specific types of equipment or services. So if you're using a, a product from a chemical manufacturer like ZEP or Ecolab or Sanimark, the chemical manufacturer will be able to provide you with documentation that says if you use this product at this concentration with this temperature of water, it will provide sufficient cleaning. There's documented evidence that chlorine bleach at a concentration between 100 and 200 ppm is sufficient to sanitize a clean surface and won't require to be rinsed. These are things that are already documented. So you can use documented evidence or you can develop your own evidence. Um, if you're using a dishwasher for sanitation of utensils, how can you tell that the temperature is hot enough? You use indicator strips with each load. There's published documentation indicating what temperature is required to sanitize when using a hot water dishwasher. Use as much information as is available to you first. If you need more information, this is where you may need to do validation and efficacy studies. So swabbing surfaces, taking micro plate tests um, to prove that your methods are effective. For most people and most times, the documented evidence of temperature, chemical concentration of your cleaner and chemical concentration of your sanitizer is enough because there's already enough documented evidence of these things to ensure that your methods are effective. Now you need to repeat this process for all of the areas that you require preventive control. So after you've gathered all this information, you're going to write your document saying who's responsible, who's going to do what, how often they're going to do it, how often the ceilings are going to be cleaned, all of those lovely things we've just discussed. You're going to write that in your, your preventive control document. You're going to make a monitoring record so that you can document that you've done all these things and cleaned all these things and check that all these things are clean then you have a preventive control program. So there's the written part, there's the documents that go with the written part, and then you need to implement the program that you've written. After you've done those things, you can go on to the next section of preventive controls that you require for your facility. So some of the more common ones that almost everybody will require is pest control, Everybody's going to require some sort of pest control program, a shipping and receiving um, program. So what are you going to do when product comes in? How are you going to make sure that you have the right product coming in the door? 
How do you know where the product goes when you ship it? Do you have some sort of traceability? A purchasing program. So how are you ensuring that you get the same ingredients all the time? A preventative maintenance program. Do your scales need to be calibrated? Do your thermometers need to be calibrated? How are you ensuring that the product that you weigh is accurate, that you're getting the same recipe each time? Facility maintenance. How are you going to make sure that the doors aren't crumbling, that bugs aren't getting through the door, that people can't break it and sabotage things? These are the things that you're going to have to look at for your preventive controls. So if we go back to the preventive controls page and click on regulatory requirements again, Once you get to this page, you scroll down to the very bottom of the page and highlighted and underlined in blue is regulatory requirements, preventive control plans. So here's where you're going to start doing your preventive control plan. Once you've written all your preventive controls, you're going to do the preventive control plan, which is like your HACCP plan. This page explains the regulatory requirements for preventive control plans. Again, if you intend to do this yourself, you really need to read through all this information. There's no easy way to explain it. You just have to do the homework. It's like learning a HACCP program. You just have to do it and go through it. Um, in this section, it goes over what you need to have uh, for each PCP and what is necessary for food safety, consumer protection, what you need to have as a preventive control plan for content for import, for export, um, if you're doing slaughter. All of those lovely things are all in this section of the document. So you really want to read through this and understand what's required of your preventive control plan. <clears throat> And every preventive control plan is going to be different, even if you're making the same product at a different facility, your control plans are going to be different because the preventive control plan takes into account all the ingredients, the condition of your establishment, all of your equipment, and all of those lovely things. So it's not just the process that you're using, but it's the process and the environment in which you are processing. So if you go back to the preventive control play page again, this time click preventive control plan overview. This is another tool that's provided on the website that you really should read if you plan on doing your own plan. They have a lovely little downloadable fact sheet, which is essentially all of this information on a downloadable fact sheet you need to read through it. I could read through it with you. Um, it's not going to do you any good because you really need to sit down and let it sink in. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom of this page, there are two links that are important. The first one is a guide for preparing preventive control plan for domestic businesses. There's also one for um, preventive control plans or import, here it is, Guide for Prepare, Preparing Preventive Control Plan for Importers. Um, there's Preventive Control Plan Templates for Importers. All of these lovely things are links that you can go to to get the information that you need to make your preventive control plan. So we are first gonna select this lovely one to the Guide Preventive Control Plans for Domestic Food Business. If you read through this guide, it explains how to develop your preventive control plan. The process that they describe is very similar to creating a HACCP plan and a HACCP program. So you develop, to develop your preventive control plan, you assemble your team, 
you go through your establishment and make sure that it's operated and maintained as required, perform a hazard analysis, establish procedures, that's where you're making your preventive controls, establish measures for consumer protection requirements. Consumer protection requirements are making sure that you're following all the applicable excuse me, all the applicable regulatory requirements and all of the labeling requirements, labeling and advertising, um, making sure that your product, if it has a standard of identity, that it meets the standard of identity, are there required packaging sizes for your product? All of those things are under the consumer protection requirements. Then assemble your documents and implement your control plan and your preventive controls. And then there's how you maintain your, pro your program. Again, really, if you're going to do this for yourself, you need to read through all of these documents. It's not something that's going to take you 10 minutes. You're going to need to set some time aside to go through them. If we go back, CFIA has also provided you with a bunch of templates, control plan templates. We're going to go to those next. So on this page, there are templates to use. And if you follow the instructions in the guide to preventive control plans, it'll take you through each template. So there's a template for um, maintaining and operating your establishment. There's a template for conducting a hazard analysis. There's a template to describe your product, to show your process flow diagram, your traffic flow diagram, hazard identification for your process and the ingredients in your process, a template to describe how you control your hazards, so there are templates for each, each section. And really, if you go through the guide, and as you go through the guide for preventive control plans, you fill out the associated templates. When you get to the end, you'll have a com all of the information that you require to have a completed preventive control and preventive control plan. Do you have to use the CFIA templates? The short answer is no. Uh, there are lots and lots of options for what type of templates you can use. Um, Manitoba HACCP Advantage is a really good option. Uh, lots of people have already started with this option. All of the sections in the Manitoba HACCP Advantage workbook cover some part of the preventive controls for a PCP, a preventive control plan. Ontario HACCP Advantage is another good um, option. Codex General Principles of Food Hygiene, again, another good option. There are many other options and programs available. All of them use the same basic strategy to determine the hazards and then put programs and procedures in place to control them. Again, CFIA, uh, prior to implementation of the Safe Food for Canadians Act, CFIA used to require some of their commodities to use the Food Safety Enhancement Program approach. On the website, there are documents and templates to put a food safety enhancement program plan together for a preventive control plan. So if you go to this link, again, it'll have templates and generic documents that show you what you need to do in order to complete your preventive control plan. Oh. What else can you use? So global food safety initiative programs, many different schemes, all founded on HACCP principles. If your business currently has a HACCP program, 
your program likely meets the requirements of a preventive control plan. If your business is currently certified to any of the Global Food Safety Initiative programs, you likely meet most of the requirements for a preventive control plan. The best thing to do is to use whatever programs and procedures you already have in place and move your program forward from there. I've expanded a checklist from the maintenance and operations establishment checklist that CFIA provides. This checklist uses the same format and it asks questions if you have a section of the act adequately addressed, asks you to justify where and how it's addressed, and I've expanded it to include all sections of the act from section 49 to 92 and then some additional requirements. Now, I use this tool every time I put together a new preventive control plan. I use it at the beginning. I complete the table and list to show how each program can either be addressed or is already addressed. So when I come to your facility, if I come to your facility, I'm going to go through each section and record in the boxes how your, how your facility and your process meets this requirement. And then I use this form again at the end, once I've written every all of the programs and processes, just to make sure that everything is covered. So for example, for sanitation, to establish the establishment and any conveyances or equipment used in it are clean and and in a sanitary condition. And cleaning and sanitizing activities do not contaminate food. So generally the things that go in here, I write the sanitation program. The sanitation program covers all the things required in the sanitation section of the Safe Food for Canadians Act. It's monitored during pre-operational inspections and on a daily checklist, whatever forms you use to monitor your sanitation. The sanitation program is monitored during pre and post use sanitation and it's recorded on the daily checklist. So everything you do to maintain this requirement and this requirement you write in this box. So the program that covers it and the forms where you're monitoring it. Those are your justifications and where and how it's addressed. So I do that for each and every re SFCR requirement. So pest control program, shipping and receiving program. And you go through it step by step. It's not a short process. So you have to take your time and you have to go through it. So my suggestions. It's not really difficult. However, it's very time consuming and there's a lot to learn about what needs to be done. There's lots of resources available, both on the CFIA website and the other resources I've mentioned. And there's also other resources mentioned on the website. If you'd like to attempt the program yourself, read through a couple of different options and see which one you like best. All of the programs have generic templates that you can use and modify to fit your program and your establishment, your process and your establishment, excuse me. Remember the basic rule, write what you do and do what you write. And if it wasn't documented, it wasn't done. My suggestions, again, read through the information before you start, prepare yourself. This is whether you hire a consultant or not, read through the information so that you're not going in blind. Always a good idea to take a HACCP course. There's lots of good courses available online. I know there's not a lot of courses that are open classroom courses right now. There's lots of good online courses and HACCP is HACCP. So whether it's a HACCP course from somewhere in the US or it's a HACCP course from in Canada, take a HACCP course and it'll help you to develop your preventive control program. Hire a consultant. There are good consultants available to hire for assistance. 
They can write the plan for you, review the plan, review what you've written, audit your program or any combination. I know for a fact that your business development specialists have information to help you choose and vet a consultant. Contact them, get that information. A consultant is worth every dollar that you spend on them because they are there to help you through the process. Again, I'd like to thank you for attending and taking the time to listen to me today. Have a good day.